when soil is healthy, it sequesters carbon. So the healthier the soil, the better functioning the carbon cycle. So if you manage that cattle in the right way, it's pooing and weeing and munching on the grass and keeping all that grass in a vegetative state. All the microbes and the soil health is always improved in that situation. It could arguably be the greatest asset that we all have to remedy the shit fight that we've found ourselves in. Welcome to the second renaissance, where we decode the rebirth of human creativity in a technology-driven world. In this second season, we explore how sustainability is elevating our human consciousness and catalyzing us to create within constraints. We decipher why now is the biggest entrepreneurial opportunity since the dawn of industrialization and what leaders can do to harness the winds of change. I'm Anders Sormanilsson, global futurist, impact champion and father and your host for the second renaissance. In today's special Christmas episode, I sit down with regenerative farmers and food fighters Matilda Brown and Scott Gooding from The Good Farm. Till and Scott share their life journeys of reconnecting with a sustainable diet that includes regenerative meat and animal proteins. The sustainability case for regenerative agriculture or regen why veganism and vegetarianism is not the climate answer, the importance of soil-based carbon sequestration, how sustainable comfort food can save the planet. We talk about some Christmas recipes and why tilling the soil is the new devil, no pun intended till. We discuss how carbon is not the world's enemy and why the agricultural system can move from being a massive carbon emitter to a carbon sequesterer and how we can all enjoy a guilt-free regen ham or Swedish meatballs this Christmas. Welcome to the show, Scott and Till, and thanks for whetting my Christmas appetite in a sustainable fashion. Matilda, Scott, welcome to the little Think Studio. Thank you. Thanks for having us. It's pretty impressive. Thank you. We're getting prepared here for, for Christmas, and I couldn't really think of anyone better to invite than two people I keep bumping into sort of surreptitiously or otherwise in, in Avalon Village and at the Worry Wood farmers markets, etc. Um, obviously, everyone's thinking about Christmas and food these mm-hmm. days. Um, I recall a year ago, I invited one of my friends who's got a really cool plant-based lab-grown meat company called All G Food. So we talked about all things not so natural necessarily, or but you know, it, meat certainly wasn't in the traditional sense on, oh. on the menu in that conversation. Yeah. Um, Did you try some? Some of his plant-based meats. Mm. I have tried his burgers that are called Bud's Burgers. Not too bad. Uh, um, <laughs> are they um, mushroom-based? I've been I've been hearing yeah. some mushroom-based. <laughs> burger alternatives and they're not too bad yeah i've had the um the impossible burger in the united states which i thought was really really interesting and Mm. you know it's even a plant-based burger that supposedly bleeds just like medium rare wow i don't know if you've had a chance to to go that far that's no is that necessary like if you're going that it bleeds it's very important for us i i I find it, it all fairly fascinating that there's this Obviously, there's a everyone's wants and desires and needs are are important. So if someone goes vegan, that's their call, right? But then why do we need to package food in the plant-based foods, the shape of a sausage or the shape of a pork cutlet? Mm. And why can't it be its own thing? Mm. Because if you're vegan and you're opposed to um, meat for whatever reason, why would you want something in a supermarket shelf that looks like what you're trying to avoid. Mm. So why would you want a plant-based burger that bleeds? Like, what's going on there? It's a bit weird. I guess it's like humans are accustomed to what we we know. So maybe there's like thousands Mm. of years of sausage evolution. I kind of get a sausage thing. Sausages are like, it's very convenient to have a sausage in a roll or on a sandwich, you know? Mm. So I kind of, I kind of get that. I don't really get the, the, Bleeding. plant-based looking looking like a piece of chicken or something like just anyway we've let did i interrupt your intro <laughs> no no it's a perfect <laughs> intro so i'm sitting here with matilda brown and scott gooding from the good 
farm mm -hmm. and um, it's sort of Christmas times out and everyone's of course thinking about you know what to put on, on, on the Christmas table. Um, I remember a few years ago watching this movie when I was living in Sweden called Cowspiracy. Mm, yeah, I've seen it. Yeah. And, you know, it sort of shamed me into becoming a vegetarian and even vegan at the time. But I know you guys have a very different perspective on... No, I, I was exactly the same. I right. watched that and I watched probably four others in the same weekend and became vegan immediately. Mm. Um, in fact, I was vegetarian before that. So I was vegetarian for maybe five years, vegan for probably about, you know, six or seven, and then vegetarian, and then met Scott, who was a total meat eater. And then by that point, my, my body was sort of, <clears throat> my health had kind of gotten to the point where I really felt like I needed to start eating meat again. Um, and during the time that I was vegetarian and vegan, I also had kind of an eating disorder that was slightly disguised by being a vegan as well. So there was like a lot going on with my eating during the years of my 20s. Um, um, and Thro throw in overtraining. And yeah, and, and, you know, it was just like my, my background will probably get <laughs> get to this at some point, but is acting and the film industry. So I grew up um, sort of, you know, like, um, you know, feeling like I needed to conform to some sort of, what, you know, look or body size or that sort of thing. So, um, but then it, I did watch those documentaries and they were very convincing and I absolutely did not want to contribute to a system of farming that hurt animals. Um, and um, uh, primarily for that reason, like I didn't really understand about the impacts of farming on the land at that point. It was definitely more um, an ethical, you know, reason for, for animals, kind of why, why I became a vegan. And then... Um, yeah, and then now we have a meat company. So. so was this a way for you guys to reconcile? Because you're, you're business partners, but also life partners, right? So, so you mm. meet an omnivore and someone that, you know, I just dug out of my own, you know, kitchen um, here that, you know, the keto diet, for example, which, which mm. I love. I was sharing with Scott that while I love eating, you know, um, meat and meat that's been harvested and you know treated beautifully and you know humanely through its lifetime grass-fed etc yeah um, it's high on my agenda my my wife loves pasta and carbs and she's like we can't just do this meat mm. and salad thing yeah um i know keto is more than that but also the other one of course is the sustainable diet uh, as well by by scott so yeah. we've got vegan meeting sort of omnivore but probably low carb maybe um, yeah. how, how does that how does that go when you start dating well I um, yeah like so as I said I'd, I'd sort of <laughs> this is quite a big conversation I'm, I'm, tr I'm gonna try and be concise but um, I started sort of dieting from a very young age um, and so but the time I met Scott and I really knew nothing about nutrition so I was kind of like taking stabs in the dark um, like I should, should I try that? I'll try that diet. Like I was just a, a typical kind of, um, you know, a teen that, um, that sort of put on weight in my teen years and then struggled, struggled with that. Um, and then should have tried like every kind of diet to sort of work, work out how to lose weight. Um, but by the time, you know, and then got into my twenties and started counting calories and running every day and, you know, eating lettuce and got, you know, basically, you know, sort of not anorexic, but was quite thin and not, and malnourished, I would say. And, but my hormones had gotten sort of, I think, just all over the place. And so sort of by the time Scott came along, I still knew nothing about nutrition. It was just a whole lot of stuff I'd read um, and was, my mind was sort of quite muddled. Um, and then he came along and being someone who is, all about health and, you know, his life is nutrition and knows a lot about it um, and knew that I was a vegetarian. He, he, he sort of inquired in, in a very kind way because he's not someone who would ever be like, you shouldn't be vegetarian. Mm -hmm. um, but he was more kind of, you know, why don't you eat meat? And, um, and, and, you know, I sort of talked about it being from the, I didn't want to contribute to a system of farming that hurt animals. Mm -hmm. 
And then he was, um, you know, sort of always about food sovereignty and and always knew far, uh, butchers that knew where their meat had come from um, or that sort of he could trust. And he introduced me to that that sort of meat. And, I mean, pretty quickly, like, he made slow-cooked lamb that was sort of cooking over eight hours and smells <laughs> wafting through the house. And it was, like, my, <laughs> my first... Um, you know, like my, my breaking my vegetarianism. Mm. Um, when he took the lid off, I was like, just couldn't wait to eat it. <laughs> mm-hmm. And and that was kind of it. Like when I ate that lamb, it was like my body was just thanking me. Mm. <laughs> and it was like my bones needed WD-40. Like mm. I just got to the point where my, my, my brain felt like it wasn't working properly anymore. Like I wasn't eating all the good fats. Um, and I, di- and I didn't really look back. Um, so, and that, that really changed the way that I ate. Like Scott's knowledge around food and thank God because, I mean, eating vegetarian and vegan food is boring. You know, it gets really, <laughs> you really get bored of it. I was really bored of the way that I was just not enjoying food anymore. So, and in a sense, sort of personally unsustainable potentially. I mean, I'm sure Novak Djokovic yeah. might say otherwise, right? But... Um, <laughs> You know, so from a sustainability perspective, just on a personal level, maybe mm. unsustainable from, from, from yeah, what Yeah, I think, yeah, totally. I think it was unsustainable. I think I think my body got into the point where it was crying out for something else. So it's not uh, necessarily the case that all vegans are, are bad humans, but <laughs> there, is a, there is a sense that, you know, cows and, and sheep and, 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 and lamb and, you know, that consuming and, and having to harvest animals that have been you know farting or you know eating bad things or that we have to grow produce for that also release carbon emissions it leads to the agricultural system or ecosystem being one of the main contributors to carbon emissions in the world so there's another little shame fact that you know 22 percent of the world's global carbon emissions come from agriculture and of course the fingers get pointed at animals and as a result, anyone who eats meat. Mm. Mm-hmm. What are your <laughs> thoughts on this? And is, is there a counterfactual to all of this? Yeah, I think it's a very... To, to understand a lot of this takes a degree of sophistication. Like, it's there's many layers to it. But the problem with culture today that you, you're sitting one or the other opposing camp, and there's a lot of grey, right? There's a lot of stratifications to all this discussion. One might be that, yes, animals grazing on land requires land. That's a given, right? But a lot of that land is untenable for crops, right? We've got a farm up north, five hours north, and a lot of that paddock space devoted to our cattle is cragged and there's depressions and there's wooded areas, there's um, creeks running through it. So it's... It's untenable to grow crops. So that's one consideration. Mm. So that's one of, part of this greyness, right? The other is, and, and you alluded to it, is that a shit ton of crops are grown to feed cattle. So I don't, I don't know the stats, but it, it's pretty staggering. You know, glo- the global food production, corn, maize, rye, that then eventually goes into the feedlots to... Mm fast forward their growing, you know, to to get them to maturation in terms of ideal weight, and then they go to slaughter. Like that's a And that's in the factory farming system. That's a system that's the feedlot. That whole system Mm. is fairly upside down. Right? And you can pull that apart because there's this consumer expectation as to how much marbling our beef should have, how much fat coverage our beef should have the size of our steaks, the colour of our steaks. So that that all is that's somewhat our fault that there's this um, a criteria, if you like, a benchmark that our food needs to look and feel and taste like it does. And so to achieve that, you know, it's kind of the chicken and the egg, but to achieve that, we've created this highly commoditized, highly industrialised version of cattle farming, which means that good proportion of cattle will be finished in feedlots and to accelerate their growth they're given a high 
grain diet, a complex of maize and rye and corn and soy and all this other stuff that, you know, has fattens us up as well, but that's another <laughs> conversation. But it does a very efficient economical job, and that's to fatten up the cow. So in that context, yes, the the vegan side of the fence has an argument, right? But we're not we're not perpetuating that system. We're we're actually sort of yes, we're dealing with cattle, and we're, we're dealing with animals. But if if it was to be a spectrum in terms of animal welfare and an animal living its best life, we're on the other side of that picture. Mm. So, you know, our animals are finished on grass. So. Maybe people don't know, but it's a, it's a worthwhile exercise in explaining this, that all animals, all so well, I'm talking about cows here, because cows get a bit of a raw deal in this global debate, right? Mm -hmm. They get a few fingers pointed at them. So all cows are, start their life on grass, but about historically about 40% in Australia, and it's creeping now up to about 50%, will finish on in feedlots. And how long they spend in feedlots is dependent upon a, a bunch of factors, but it could be as short as two weeks, but as long as 12 weeks, maybe more. Mm. And they see massive weight gain. and obviously, Massive weight obviously, gain. Obviously the farmers mm. want to get the most yield out of Yeah, out it, of that's, cows. that's when it becomes a really highly commoditized system. Mm -hmm. So their, their weight is uh, monitored possibly daily. Um, to get that outcome that we all expect. So when we reach for a sirloin in Woolies or Coles or wherever, it looks the way that we uh, expect it to look. Mm -hmm. um, so going back to that spectrum, we're on the other side of that spectrum <laughs> in terms of animal welfare and the, the animal living its best life. So if it's finished on grass which means if you manage that in a particular way, it can actually be very beneficial for the climate solution. You know, it, it, it could arguably be the greatest asset that we all have as a global society to, to remedy the shit fight that we've mm -hmm. found ourselves in. So if you manage that cattle in the right way, it's, it's pooing and weeing and munching on the grass and keeping all that grass in a vegetative state and then it's shitting and it's pissing and it's moving on. Mm -hmm. So then, you know, all the microbes and the soil health is always improved in that situation. But it does come down to, again, you, I think you said it, and it's, it's not the cow, it's the how. And in this situation, it's how can we use the cow almost as the tool to help us on a global scale. Mm. And I think the thing that's important to, to also say there is that when soil is healthy, it sequesters carbon. Mm. You store carbon in soil. So the healthier the soil, you know, the more, the, 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 the better functioning the carbon cycle. And that methane that the cows are farting out is part of that carbon cycle. I just wanted to add in that in yeah, case people I mean, didn't know yeah, about the... Because, the, it, I, I mean, as a, as a futurist, I, I'm always, you know, keen to find out, you know, the latest and greatest in, you know, carbon sequestration technologies and you, you look at what the big big miners like BHP and Santos and, and, and Rio, et cetera, are doing and, you know, it's, it's mm. you know... They're talking about, you know, yes, you know, there might be a, you know, a, a coal-fired power plant over here, but, you know, next to it, you know, we're going to take all of that carbon out of the atmosphere and we're going to mm. store it under the soil through all this amazing carbon sequestration mm. technologies. And then I'm like, we've got trees and we've got soil mm. that do mm. similar stuff. Mm. Um, and I'm, I'm fascinated in, in, in some of those cycles that seemingly we've forgotten about, but then... I mean, there's obviously people like you at, at the good farm and, and regenerative farmers and the re regenerative farming movements that are now saying that, no, the cow and how we do agriculture is one of the, you know, one of the keys to actually unlocking some solutions. Yeah. I mean, so when you're looking at soil health and, and vegetation, so, you know, a, a leaf will take um, carbon, sunlight, water. It needs those ingredients to eventually store carbon it donates some of the carbon to soil and then that's feeding micro um, diversity and, and that's what we want and, and if you 
leave that soil untouched, it'll lock that carbon in the soil for an indefinite amount of time. So this, what I'm about to say now, is going back to that grey area. And now we can't be too, we can't be too close-minded when we sit in one camp or the other. So when we're talking about crops, so forget about animals for a second, the same, um, you can subscribe to a, a plant-only diet, but you can still contribute to the climate crisis. Or you can subscribe to a plant-only diet and you can be a benefit. So it's how that land is managed, right? So if you've grown huge paddocks, as far as I can see, of corn, that in of, in of itself creates problems. So you're going to have to combat the pests that are attracted to that one species. One species doesn't occupy huge paddocks in nature. That doesn't doesn't happen. Doesn't yeah. exist. Yeah. So then we've got pesticides and probably herbicides and and, and potentially fertilizer if you're not managing that land in the right way, i.e. growing multiple species and rotating. And then it comes to harvesting, you're gonna dig up that, you're gonna plow up that land. You're gonna you're gonna have machinery that goes into the land and turns it over, which is essential for getting the plant mm. out of the ground and harvesting, great, that serves one purpose, but in the process of doing that, you're unlocking all that carbon. Mm. So t tilling is the new devil. T yeah. Tilling so is the new devil, it's, yeah. Until and I talk about this. Not, not, yeah, my, not, not yeah, me, yeah, Till. No, no, no <laughs> pun intended here, yeah. sorry. Yeah, we've been texting. Yeah. <laughs> um, we, we talk about this a lot, that, and I think it's, it's really important. Like, again, it, it's about a sophisticated understanding of these large concepts. I think we're, we're very quick to jump into a camp. So it's, it's actually not, it's not about the animal or the plant, right? It's actually about how that animal or plant or anything in between is grown and managed and mm. is raised. And so you can contribute to the, the global crisis in a positive or in a negative way by subscribing to whatever persuasion is yours based on how that plant has been managed or how that... But I guess then from sort of a you know vegetarian or vegan perspective, if all you eat is, I mean, this sounds super reductionist, but you know, if you all, all you eat is polenta and, and, and lettuce, but it's grown in a way that's very you know monoculture and right. it's you know factory farming and all the rest, you actually and probably there's maybe some snakes and some birds and some rodents living in those fields mm. that mm. you know are damaged, um, and you're also doing it with you know tilling technologies. Mm you're potentially doing massive carbon yeah. damage. I think that's that's mm. the risk that, that, I mean, it's sort of the problem with like social media these days or any, anything that, where anywhere you get your information at a really base level. Mm. Um, so I think, I think, you know, there's a lot of people who, who go vegan um, because they want to be, they don't want to be contributing to the climate problems that we have but they don't do any more research into that. So it's like, okay, for me, you go, okay, great. Well, that's go, go vegan then. But what are you replacing your meat with? Like what are you eating much more bread, wheat, grains, rice, legumes? How is that all being farmed? Mm -hmm. um, are you getting it all from the organic farmer's market? Do you know your farmer? Are they using sprays? Um, how are they tending to their land? Mm -hmm. There's, there's, I mean, you and and then you kind of go like you can't live your life making sure that you, you know, you you. I mean, you can't. You just you can't live life. Some people some people probably do, but it's hard to tick all those boxes. Yeah. It's really hard to want to do the right thing and 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 our system of our food system is not set up for doing the right thing. It's really hard to know where your food comes from. So it's really hard to actually be, you know, kind of contributing positively to the environmental movement by food choices. 
um, if you are just simply going, I'm going to, that's my, that's what I'm going to do now, but I'm not going to educate myself in any other ways. Mm. Um, but it's actually not made easy for us. Because it's not. Of, because <laughs> as Till saying, like it's not clear to me or many of us where any of our food comes from. I feel, mm. I feel like we're at this tipping point of, um, of that being more a thing particularly, and, and meat sort of leading the charge with that, but it's less obvious where our corn has come from or mm. our legumes or, you know, fill in the blank. Um, so we're sort of almost going back in time, right? We're going, you know, the buzzwords are regen, sustainable, organic, um, local. All those things have been talked about for, you know, several years so we're going back, so we're leapfrogging back in time over the industrialised food system, back to when we were, everything was probably organic, well, it would have been, um, pre the industrial <coughs> uh, farming revolution. Everything was local, um, there would have been a higher degree of um, sustainable farming, you know, rotation, cop coverage, less monoculture, all that stuff. So it's like we're going... You know, we're having a, a, a retro sort of um, um, revolution in terms of agriculture. And so all these touch points that now we're seeking out, it needs to be diverse across all food groups. So we know where our salmon's coming from. We know where our pork chops are coming from. We know where our legumes are coming from. And at that point, people can make really <coughs> informed, conscious choices. Okay, do I want to shop here, eat that thing that potentially causes more climate and environmental and ec ecological harm, mm. or do I want to eat this thing um, over here that can contribute to the solution? And so, uh, you know, I really want to hammer that point home that it's it's nothing to do with <coughs> plants versus animals. It's actually the, the, the farming methodology mm. and principles and guidelines. But it's very hard to to really know where your food comes from. I mean, the reason one of the reasons we started the Good Farm Shop was because I wanted to know that I I wanted to be eating regeneratively farmed meat. If I was going to be like to give you some context, as I said, I I wasn't eating meat. I, I didn't go vegan for climate reasons. I went vegan for animal reasons. But I hadn't started hearing about regenerative farming until. Um, my mum started regenerating our farm. Mm. We've had our farm for 40 years, since before I was born. Mm. It's always been um, farmed conventionally, so um, sprayed, um, you know, cattle stay in one paddock, one big paddock, they eat all the grass down. Meanwhile, sprays um, over here, mm -hmm. fertilisers to grow that grass, then those cows move over to that grass, eat that grass. Meanwhile, the other paddocks get crops down, sprayed fertilisers to grow that, and the, and the land becomes addicted <laughs> to the fertiliser, the soil can't grow crops on its own. And that's, you know, that's sort of like conventional way of farming. Sounds like a kind of self-reinforcing negative cycle that then... It's, you, it's then an addiction. To to, yeah. yeah. You can see the, the, the paddocks that are grown this way. They're lush green. You know, regen farms are tufty and um, kind of messy looking scruffy. And they've got like, you know, there's, there's trees poking up in them. The, the conventionally farmed paddocks are the ones that everyone goes, oh, look how beautiful that is. You know, it's, mm -hmm. you know, a beautiful Rose paddock of, of yeah. you know, no, not many trees, um, beautiful green grass from the urea that's put on it. Um, and, then, and then if you see a lake nearby or a um, water nearby, you'll see some really, like, dirty kind of red sort of stuff on the surface, mm -hmm. and that's the urea running down that's, getting into the system, the, food, the water systems. Mm. Um, that's how you can kind of spot it. Um, so, but what I, what I was saying was my mum had started to talk about re regenerating the farm. So we were hearing, I was hearing this word regenerative farming for a while and I was sort of like, la, 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 la. <laughs> like I wasn't paying any attention to it because mum's been, mum go, mum's been going on about the environment for a long time. She's, you know, she's... Quite the activist. Yeah, she's... Yeah, she is. And, you know, when you're, when you're young, you sort of kind of like, I don't know, I wasn't gung-ho about it. Um, and it really wasn't until, um, I think we went up to the farm 
a couple of Christmases ago and her and Mick, the farmer, were sort of wandering around talking about the farm and what they'd been doing differently. And I think it just like, it was like we'd heard it enough times. I'd heard it enough times. I'd heard Mm. small things enough that I started to take notice of it um, and then started to do our own research on it and then basically came back to Sydney and was like, I want to be eating the, I want to be eating the beef from the farm. I want to be eating meat that's contributing positively to the environment. How do we get it? So then we went to the butcher shop, you know, and said, do you guys, you know, have any regeneratively farmed meat? Um, He looked at me like, (laughs) I was in like, shut up lady, just get your meat. (laughs) It was COVID. There were lines outside the door. You know, there wasn't time for chit chat. I wanted to know if he knew the farms that, Mm. that he's, beef came from couldn't give me an answer about too that many questions till yeah um, too many yeah. questions like you're not I'm supposed to ask questions and then i went to the supermarket <laughs> i was like oh sorry um do you know do you guys have any regeneratively farmed meat <laughs> she was yeah. like what <laughs> yeah. anyway so basically kind of became quite apparent that you can't get regeneratively farmed produce locally or mm. um in very many places it's a really new term to people I didn't even know that most butcher shops don't know where their meat comes from. They just get it crates in. Mm-hmm. They don't actually butcher. It's like butchering is a dying art. Most butcher shops get crates of cuts in from a wholesaler or an abattoir. Um, so we we so anyway, we basically were like, we've got to get the meat from the farm, and that's we and that's how the good farm shop started. We just wanted to know we were eating regeneratively farmed meat. And we knew that our farm was being farmed regeneratively. Um, it's now certified land to market, which is the, um, you know, the the sort of stamp of approval for for farms that are doing right by the land, and they get their soil tested and all that stuff. Um, and so it started as a simple cow share to like a group of friends um, who we thought might be interested in eating this type of food. Um, but yeah, it's it's my point is it's it's really hard to know where your food is coming from. We've come up, you know, we make ready meals from our produce, and even just I have tried them; they're fantastic. Oh. And you're still yeah. standing. <laughs> well, I'm still standing. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I think I'm, I'm trying to think. Of, I, I met Scott at uh, Warrywood Markets. I think it's probably three weeks ago. So I, was, I think I picked up the there was a chicken curry. There mm-hmm. was stroganoff, maybe. Then the beef stroganoff. Yeah, you remember well both. Beautiful meals. So, mm-hmm. yeah. Yeah, well, Scott I mean, we're, we're slaves learning, away. We're learning that, um, you know, going back to how hard it is for the consumer, it was hard for us and then that that was the spark and the genesis for the good farm that started off the cow share scheme. But we're, you know, we're getting towards 18 months into the business and we're learning that, hey, some of this terminology is too... Um, avant-garde is too new it's too so we're having to like meet meet the market right mm. so we we've got on our labels on our ready meals is like and our website it's like regen this regen that you know it's regen chicken curry and people you know 80 percent of people go what's regen chicken curry <laughs> yeah, like it's yeah you're vegan. vegan now you're vegan yeah. <laughs> some sort yeah. of cuisine or something uh, is that is that, is that asian <laughs> Um, so we're learning that okay, well, mm. maybe, and, yeah, you know, let's meet the market. What's the market accustomed to right now? It's not to say that people won't understand and recognise regen in in the future, but now it's um, you know maybe organic's a better word or sustainable or environmentally conscious or whatever mm. it is. So we're kind of, we're learning as well, like um, all the time. Yeah, yeah. And then you also learn, like, most people don't. Most, most people, people don't, don't care. <laughs> yeah, wow. Well, actually, you know, yeah. You really most have to go. Are, there's a lot of people that do, particularly around here, mm. and that's probably the socioeconomic stratification, status mm. of people around here. So typically the, the higher you are in that stratification, the more, you, the more bandwidth you have to, to care, to care. right? Mm. When, when life is a struggle and you're fighting for survival, you don't give a shit about... Well, you care. Mm. Your priorities are elsewhere. You know, yeah. you're trying to survive, so you just mm. you just want to feed your family. Those on the front line <clears> in <throat> Ukraine aren't worrying about the 
CO2 emissions mm. of... Yeah. Um, I forget where I was going with that. Yeah. But, <laughs> but the, no, the, the, it's a good point. I think um, because, you know, regenerative farming or organic or biodynamic, I mean, mm. it can conjure up images of, you know, luxury and, uh, and you mm. know... Mm. all sorts of you know privilege etc mm. and then but it's interesting just and i and I, I meet that sort of resistance when 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 i'm out working with, with clients to kind of say oh well you know that's a nice you know for, for first world problem and all, all these mm. kind of things right but you know, a lot of the research that's coming out now as well is that even you know in australia 66 percent according to one piece of research um of consumers in australia now um would favor sustainable food, for example, and nine out of ten, at least in research, mm. say right. that they would be happy to pay a premium for sustainably grown mm. foods. Mm. Mm. It's um, actually, yeah. And then there is a now, a, you know, a rise <clears throat> of what's known as the conscious consumer. Um, and again, raconteur's global research out of the UK shows that 55% of global consumers at least aspire to wanting to know where they're food and their produce mm. and their products mm. come from sort of from you know from mm. f from farm to table or producer to mm. consumer so there seems to be a shift and even in the pandemic when people are doing it tough in the uk um organics mm. organic sales went through the roof i think it was like a t well, at least a 10 10 percent increase in the first pandemic year and it kept oh. going that oh, way okay. yeah. we'll put that in the show notes but um there is a seems to be a groundswell and it, i think even in walmart this is about 15 years ago, um, Walmart in the United States and its fresh produce section um, already back, I think, in 2006 or seven. Again, we'll need to do a little fact check on that. 10% of its fresh produce was grown locally. Now, mm. there's defi different definitions about mm. what is local mm. and all the rest. So, yes, I think there is still this sort of I moniker that maybe it's privilege and, and it's luxury and all the rest. But I think people, people across the world, you know, mm care uh, about where their food comes from and whether it, you know what they're about to feed their children is, is something that's going to be healthy and yeah I, I guess maybe i was too brash with that statement that you know the lower you are and the social economic you know if life's a struggle you don't care that your, your mind's elsewhere is probably a better way to yeah. to frame it not that you don't <clears throat> care I mean, but I, I can relate to it because i remember i remember dating many moons ago a, a french vegetarian and I remember that exact comment because it came from my from my parents in Sweden. And um, whenever we sat down for a meal, and they tried to cater, you know, mm. the best they could. But like for them, not eating meat that that for them is like that's a slap in the face. And that that to them seemed super entitled, and that like she didn't appreciate wow. the food they put on yeah. the right. table. And so they they didn't gel particularly well. <laughs> um, but for them, it was like, you know, you eat what you're served. And right. so, you mm -hmm. know, like, and for them and, and their parents who've grown up into the depression, you know, mm. like you ate every bit of the animal from nose to tail. But the idea of vegetarianism seemed to them to be very sort of entitled. So mm. It's, mm. it's interesting. I think um, just on the point of people caring, I think people do care, but I think to an extent. Um, and this is just a story from an, another, you know, Shot. I'm not going to say who it is because I don't have the permission to tell this story. But I like the story because it's it is it has it's a good representation of like we do markets um, and um, we do them with a few other butcher shops. And I was talking with him <laughs> um, recently about you know this sort of thing. Do people care or do they not care? And how much do they care? And how much do they want to spend? Um, and he says he gets in. Two type two types of chicken. One chicken is the the free range chicken, the proper free range chicken that's mm. pecking around, and the other one is uh, legally free range, which is not not free range, mm. not what you would think free range is. And so the consumer comes along and says, "I want, I'd like the free range chicken," and he goes, "Great, it's just here," and he goes, "It's thirty two dollars." Oh, I don't want to pay thirty two dollars. Well, um, but but what's this chicken over here? That's that's twenty two. Yeah, well, that's that's the legally free range chicken, but the only grass that one sees is on the way to the <laughs> processing mm. place. Mm. Good, I'll take that one. You know, it's like, what's your idea of 
you know, what's the consumer's idea of free range? Oh, it's pecking around, it's eating the worms, it's, you know, that it's that proper free range. But when it comes to paying $32 for it, they just don't want to. Mm. And that's what it costs. That is what it costs. I mean, well, it's a true that cost is the that people have forgotten about. Mm. Yeah. You know, from from a sustainability perspective, mm. if someone buys a, a t shirt for, yeah. for for ten dollars, yeah. you know, there's probably some illegalities <laughs> somewhere mm. in the supply chain, mm. whether it's in, you know, in Bangladesh mm-hmm. where people are not getting paid properly. Mm. Like to, for, to think that something in, you know, a t shirt can cost ten dollars to, to produce well, yeah. b- b- when it lands in yeah. you know, whatever part mm. of the world you live mm. in is 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 kind of crazy because mm. people aren't paying you know, the hashtag, you know, true cost of, mm. of yeah, when you get, food. Yeah, when you can otherwise. get a $10 chicken at a supermarket, a $42 chicken seems ludicrous. Mm. And that's what, that's what the chickens are that we sell. We make $3 on a chicken, <laughs> like, mm. but we get them from a small family-owned regenerative farm. I mean, they're um, gold. They're golden chickens. Mm. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, but I mean, people love yeah. them. They do. Ta- they do taste better. Mm. They hundred percent. I mean, I won't eat. I'm a. I'm a total meat regenerative snob now, obviously. Mm. And I really feel because I really feel like you can taste the difference. Yeah. Um, I mean, I think when you see when you have watched those vegan documentaries and you see how animals can be treated, I feel like I can taste that <laughs> yeah. in a mm. in a chicken. I feel like I. I'm like I don't. Like that tastes disgusting to me. So mm. knowing, I don't know whether it's like unconscious bias or um, whether it, it really does taste that much better. Um, but I, I just I just think there's is it's it's chalk and cheese the factory farmed animals to the animals that have had a full life on grass. I mean I mean there's, there's mm. sort of go, going back to an old, old point I made earlier like we. There's a there's two parts to our education. There's the part about the agriculture, and um, it's the how. It's the it's not the cow. It's the how. So that's one part. And what is regen? The the other is remodeling what we expect our beef to taste like, feel like, look like. So if you if you if you have a a, a rump steak that's being fi- finished in a feedlot versus a like they they will look different, mm. gram for gram. One will have more fat coverage and marbling than the other, and they'll taste different. So the the grass finished version will taste meatier. It will taste gamier, and there'll be difference in coloration and all that. So it's that in of itself. Like I I expected. Well, I was talking to our farmer when we first started this, and he was like, "You need to tell people." That there'll be a difference in mouthfeel and flavour and texture, um, and I and I expected more pushback than than we've had. Mm. But I think people that, who come to us and buy our produce, I mean, we only have. I'm not just saying this because we're live here, but we have great feedback on on all aspects mm. of our of our produce. Oh, there could there could very well be people who have it and then don't order again. Of course, yeah, I, who I don't thought about that. <laughs> I doubt they're going to tell us that they don't like it. <laughs> I but keep buying that little <coughs> beautiful green soup that you guys. Oh yeah, the, the, the that green seems soup seems to have been so popular that I I keep missing out. I know so, it does yeah. go. Maybe maybe quick. maybe Santa Claus will bring me. Some. <laughs> <laughs> um, that's actually it's very good for you that soup because yeah. basically bone broth. Yeah. With some, you know, green kale soup. and spinach in it. Yeah. <laughs> and some fantastic. butter. Fantastic! Amazing. Um. We, yeah, no, we do have really good. I mean, people do love. I think people try sometimes try it because they're like, mm. "What is regenerative meat? Is it mm. going to taste different?" Yeah, they're mm. curious. Um, I think they they like the idea, obviously, of having of being able to eat meat and feel good about it. Mm. Um, that's certainly my feeling when I eat it. Like, I'm happy to be eating that meat, knowing that it's helping, not you know doing the opposite. Um, but then I think they, um, it's tasty. I, I agree. And I like, I think, and I, I picked this point up in, in, in one of your books um, that it's like a little bit like going back and eating your, you know, grandmother's cooking. Um, mm. Certainly sort of the keto approach. Like, 
I was blessed with a grandmother, Ingrid, in Sweden who grew up on a farm and, like, her, her mm. cooking was really hearty. And, I mean, even mm. when I share the stories with Nicole of, you know, like, you know, her scraping, you know, all the oil out of the, you know, yeah. out of the pan onto the food. Like, you know, some Gosh. people would be like, oh, my God, that, that sounds yeah. crazy. But I'm like, there was so much flavor. And yeah. so, you know, the whole regenerative movement, biodynamic, the keto approach, the, you know, the good fats. I mean, it's mm. it's inspired me to get more active in, in, in the kitchen, um, which my wife, Nicole, loves when I actually cook. Mm. And um, so when I buy s- steaks, yes, they tend to be at least, you know, grass-fed, mm. uh, sometimes biodynamic, sometimes now. Obviously, it's going to be regen as well. But, like, I look after, I look after every part of that mm. meat. So... Mm. You know, I am the one, even when we go out to a restaurant, it's like, oh, that T-bone, that's like, I'll be the one gnawing on that oh, yeah. in, in, in the restaurant. Everyone's like, what are you doing, mate? <laughs> I'm like, no, probably got like fat on the sides of the face and, you know, <laughs> little little bits of meat stuck in my teeth. But, and then it's, you know, after that, I'm like, can I keep the bone, you know, and I will make my own broth. The chickens that we eat, for example, you know, that like the mm. bones all go into, right. um, mm into a pot mm. and um so i make my own bone broth so watch out i might there might be some competition <laughs> at the markets uh, but like and and then when i'm when you when, you, when we use that broth you know to go into a you know spaghetti bolognese or um you know or into a soup or whatever it happens mm. to be we like mm. you, i feel like you can mm. taste mm. the goodness mm in it um so i agree with your point that it it tastes better yeah i talk about being the custodian of of your own health right so taking ownership not outsourcing and this might take years to accomplish and we might not always be 100 percent um in control of that but the 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 most fast-tracked way to be the custodian of your own health is to cook as much food that you in, ingest in your own kitchen. When we're outsourcing through restaurants and cafes and fast food outlets, you, you're also outsourcing your own health because they invariably, and there's a few brands that don't fit into this mold, but they invariably want to make money that your health isn't at the core of their business. Mm. So what you're saying is you're cooking from scratch, right? You're getting bones, like... Most the, the part of the animal that's sort of underutilized and often thrown away, you're collecting bones and then you're building a, a broth and then the broth goes into the soup or the casserole or the whatever. And so you, there's multiple layers to that. And then what you're doing is you're creating an environment that your family can enjoy. You're sitting down, you're enjoying that, you're nourishing yourself and your family. Like that to me is like the greatest gift anyone can give themselves and their family the ability to cook and you don't have to be Jamie Oliver it's not about being an expert it's actually being being brave enough to experiment and mm. we've kind of we've you know your grandma would have been typical of everyone in her generation I would have thought cooking from scratch in a mm. in a kitchen mm. my my grandma and my and luckily my parents echoed that but we've lost that connection. We've lost connection with cooking and we've lost connection with food. So going back, like we need to retro, we need to attach to those, the stories of our grandparents and the, the love and appreciation of, of ingredients and getting back into the kitchen because everything's like ultra convenient now. Like mm. we can bloody order food and it comes in 15 minutes. Like that's mm. mental, like mm. milk run and... Um, I, think Sherpa. Is yeah. I think it's less than I think it's like 10, 10 minutes Like less. it's amazing. <clears throat> like I'm not anti-progress. Like that is phenomenal that something can be delivered on your doorstep mm. within like whatever it is, 10 minutes. Yeah. That's in, a, in a drone or a robot. Yeah, it's mm. mental. Like it's pretty exciting. Mm. But that further contributes to us really disconnecting from real food and cooking. Because cooking is more than – I know I'm rambling now, but cooking is more than just – putting a few ingredients together. It's it's the act of serving you and your family and bringing you all together. Like you, you don't get that when you're ripping something off the, you know, ripping the lid off something and eating it straight mm. out the container. Like mm. we, we, we need to be more conscious about all aspects of food. 
not just where it comes from, but how we treat it and how we consume it. You know, mm. yeah, I think that's a, and only then, right? So only then when most of the food that you're consuming is made in your own kitchen, can you truly start to become the custodian of your own health? And if someone is listening to this and they go, oh, shit, I don't, I don't cook anything because there will be mm. people that don't cook anything, right? They get a smoothie from the cafe on the way to work. They get some sushi, lunchtime at work, and then they get whatever for dinner. Like, they will exist, and that's because of the culture and the society that we're in. Mm. So a, a, a what is your message to them? Well, a move in the right direction might be, okay, <laughs> well, over the next 12 months, I'm going to pledge to myself and my family that 10% of the food consumed over my week, mm. I make. So that might mean that you make the smoothie on your way out the door. Might be that simple. Or, or do you, you make cook scram- with your kids when you, you, you make, know, you make it kids, turn into a yeah. fun. Yeah. And so it, there's no rush for this stuff. Like it could be that that 10% becomes 20% over the following. So in two years, you've gone from nothing and outsourcing your food and outsourcing your health to now a quarter almost of the food that I consume, I make and I know exactly what's in it to the herb, mm. to the oil, to the spice, to the, to the fats, to the, you know, I know explicitly what's in that dish. Mm. And I've brought all my members of my family together, even if it's like once or twice a week. Mm. And then there's conversations, there's check-ins, there's... And so it has this like potency and power to unite people, people to connect... We're in an unconnected world right now, despite mm. all the connections that we have digitally. So it, it's potent, powerful stuff, and not to be yeah. under. Well, I mean, there's so much symbolism to food too, right? Yeah. Whether it's yeah, whether it's breaking bread. I know that's high yeah. in carbs, but you know, or you know, the Last <laughs> Supper, and you know, yeah. um, you know, lots of yeah. lots of religions talk about you know, <laughs> have the symbolism around you know blood and wine or what you know whatever mm. it happens to be yeah, or you know if you're if you're an atheist or you're spiritual in any, any other way you know just the coming together and, and spending mm. quality time it's often around around a meal mm. and um it is a wonderful way of, of slowing down i think also it kind of forces you to slow down so you know, yes, it's it's possible to buy the you know the the, the ribeye and do a you know reverse sear for an hour or something, and you know it doesn't take up too much of your time. But like some of the less expensive cuts, mm. if you actually just invest the time and do a mm. slow cook, mm. they can be the most the beautiful best. meals you yeah. ever have. So and the easier, it, yeah. easy. you can't stuff it up really. Mm. You can kind of set and forget. Yeah. Mm. Whereas you can stuff up a steak, right? The the error for margin for error is bigger yeah than a slow cook and the slow cook's cheaper you can put it on before work get home the whole apartment smells delicious and mm. you know it's probably yeah. you could you could turn someone you could turn vegan to meat eater <laughs> that's what he did with the slow cook lamb um oh, but yeah we're lucky in our family because scott cooks mm. all the time mm. like, i don't i thought i was a cook and then i met scott and realised I wasn't. I'm yeah, I'm not. He's got you've got a real knack for flavour though. You really do. Like everyone who eats Scott's food, like just goes, how do you make it so tasty? Mm. Like, I've done this. I've done this exact same thing. I've followed a recipe, <laughs> but there's something about the way that you cook that is it's. And and he says it's. He says it all the time. He says it's fat. It's butter, mm-hmm. <laughs> it's salt. Yeah. All those things we have shame. Yeah, all the things that we have shame, stay yeah. away from. Mm-hmm. Fats are fat. Like fat will make you fat. Not true. But it is those slow cooks, like the ribs. They're so underestimated. They're always the last ones to go, but they are the ones that are full of fl- flavor. They're the mm-hmm. cheapest. They're the best for you because they're full of that good fat. Mm. Yeah, and all the yeah. connective tissue and yeah, you know. And then if you participate in this food system, I mean, this is from a sustainability perspective. You can do it in a, in a guilt-free fashion. Yeah. Um, and you might actually be doing the environment a service. Mm. I'm casting my mind and, and refreshing my mind now. Is it Alan Savory who's one of the – is he Zimbabwean mm. farmer who sort of started <laughs> He's Australian. This region? Isn't he Australian? 
He's Australian, but I think he went to he went to Zim, uh, he went to okay. Africa. Yeah, I think it was, and um, kind of pioneered regenerative farming. Okay, so just yeah. talk us through about sort of <clears throat> like on a meta level. So I mean, Scott, you can't you kind of talked about you know how how to manage the farm in a certain way, but talk us through but like on a global level, like the regenerative farming movement and and and, and movies like is it kissing the soil or kiss the kiss soil the ground. kiss the ground. Or right. biggest little farm. That's another really good one. Yeah, that's that was that was actually one of the ones that got me listening. Okay. Mum said, "Watch biggest little farm." And yeah, it was like it's a beautiful film. It's another great recommendation. I'll I'll take that on board and then yeah, you'll want to buy been, you'll want to buy a farm. Yeah, yeah, it's just dirt. Yeah, and you'll want to regenerate it. It takes like seven years, but yeah. it's. I reckon the best place if someone sort of wants to, if this conversation is intrigued or, um, yeah, gr- growing someone's curiosity. Alan Savory's TED Talk, right? So it's, mm. TED, it's the TED Talk, whatever that is, 14 minutes or something yeah. along those lines. And he outlines his methodology of farming and he provides evidence of how he's implicated these this methodology and the results that have followed. So his, he proposes that if we manage livestock um, in a particular way, something that I've touched on today, there's an ability to turn a lot of these desertified regions through that equatorial belt Mm. into more green regions. So if there's more greenery, then obviously there's more carbon sequestration and, Mm. you know, healthier soil, and we start to sort of drag and pull carbon out of the atmosphere. I mean, it's worth noting that Till and I have been talking about this of late, how the, the world is greener, now than it was you know in recent times Mm. you know and that's because a there's more carbon so carbon is the plant's currency it need that's its fuel it needs carbon that's an essential Mm. so if there's more carbon it's easier for the plant to absorb that and convert that into sugar and to store that into the ground that's obviously feeding microbes and feeding soil biodiversity but also there's been a concerted concerted effort by the um, Indian and Chinese the Indians and the Chinese to plant trees and their population as we know is immense right mm. so if they all have um, if they all apply themselves or if some people apply themselves and they dedicate to planting trees pretty much overnight we've got <laughs> billions more trees mm. and so there's been two factors at play there's been the increase in CO2 in our atmosphere that is the plant's fuel. So the amount of foliage, the the square foot of foliage has increased. So even though there's deforestation in, in, in regions of the world, we're actually greener than we were decades ago. And it's the carbon and it's the concerted effort by mm. certain countries of this world. So... Even if we stopped all global emissions right now, what I've seen on your website and in some of your videos is that there's a lot of legacy carbon Mm. out there as well doing damage. And that soil and the way we farm might actually be a a massive solution to that. Is that that what I'm hearing? Yeah, so there'll be a... So, you know, if we all started walking to work and there was no... um, cruise liners and there's no industry massive primary industry gurgling out co2 so if things ground to a halt tomorrow there'd be this legacy of the co2 so Mm. it's not it's not like um the problem necessarily goes away even if we and that's not going to happen right it might take us a hundred years 150 years to transition to renewables might take longer so if that's the case, we need to find ways to sequester that carbon. So we need to create a, a deficit, right? So it's all there. We need to pull it into the mm. ground and, you know, farming is one way, seaweed is another, mm. and there's probably many that I'm not aware of. So and check out Paul Hawken, <laughs> right. Drawdown Project. Is that, is that the seaweed stuff? I, well, Paul Hawken in, 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 uh, in his book... Um, I've got that book, Regeneration, it's good. And Project Drawdown, I think, talks a lot about 
yeah, the power of soil to sequester no. yeah. trees as one of the best technologies to actually sequester. rewilding yeah. and rewilding, rewilding. regen. Yeah. Um, um, there's also, yeah. <laughs> I was on the panel, uh, I was on a judging panel recently for, um, it was a, it was Polestar, which is an electric car, and um, from Sweden, I should add. Right, there you go. Um, and they're coming, coming here, mm. or they've just been released here. And New York Times Australia Style Magazine uh, joined together to do their first sort of um, sustainability awards. And I was on the one of the judges on it, and one of the um, companies that came up was. Um, Turning carbon into building blocks. Building blocks. Mm. <laughs> yep. Amazing. Yeah. Just like you can build a house out of the building blocks that have taken the carbon out mm. of the atmosphere and turned it into. Yeah, I mean, mm. incredible what people are coming up with. Yeah. And of course, this goes back to the point that carbon is not necessarily bad because it is the building block of all life. Of all life. Yeah. Yet, you know, at yeah, the we, same time. We, mm. we were lucky enough. And I've can I drop names? <laughs> yeah, no, sure. I, again, if anyone's curious about this space, I, I really yeah. advi- um, suggest looking at a guy called Dr. Zach Bush. He was on tour here recently and he, we were lucky enough to have him over for lunch. And he is, is fairly unique in the sense that he combines a high in- intellectual power. So he's a smart cookie, mm. but wrapped up in compassion and love and so he's quite mm. unique in that in that regard but he talks about this as an opportunity so rather than condemning the world and there's this sense of this impending lo- doom you know like we're all mm. we've got 12 more years and mm. you know mass extinction blah 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 he's like no this is an opportunity you know co2 in the atmosphere is a is a fuel that vegetation needs. Like, mm. let's ha- let's harvest that. You know, mm. we had a bunch of people around for lunch, not just him, but it was Farmer's Footprint, print, mm. which is a great. If anyone, there's another uh, another really good um, sort of educational tool around this is Farmer's Footprint, and they brought and he's the founder of that in the states, and they've started one in Australia. They brought him out, and he toured, did a couple of tours. So we put on a lunch for them and Zach. Yeah, and he was just his his whole thing is in. It's all about how we tell this story. Let's. He doesn't even say let's not do that. He just says there's a great opportunity. That plants need carbon. We've got lots in our atmosphere. How can we use it? I mean, I'm not even going to try and <laughs> say what he said because it is just going to dumb it down so much. Mm. But I just like love that you know it, it, we are so much. There's so much talk about how scary it is and how um, how we have to act now. Mm. And it's overwhelming for people. Like, no wonder people just put their head in the sand and don't do anything. Mm. Um, I, I do – I recommend, you know, listening to Zach talk about it because it's empowering and it's really inspiring and it actually motivates you. Um, I mean, I know – I went on a trip to – Heron Island, you know Heron Island? It's a research mm-hmm. centre yeah, off the coast of North Queensland and it's a, um, you know, research centre and they they do a lot of research about the coral bleaching and the effect that the climate's had on the ocean. And, um, and there's a three-day kind of talk and you're listening to um, Tim Flannery and some other very smart scientists mm-hmm. talking about the problems that we're having and how fucked we are if we yeah. and I went away from that I was ju- had just fell pregnant with my first child and I think like I just felt I felt really sad mm. about and overwhelmed and um I wanted to act but I had no idea what or how to and so instead I did nothing and I mean I got morning sickness so I couldn't really do much anyway I was pretty much um you know laid up yeah, for, and, you know, nine, and I had nine. But I sort of like, you know, it was the beginning of wanting to do something. Yeah. And it, it took a good two, you know, two and a half years for me to like, you know, I was kind of going like, well, how can, how can, because, you know, I, I'm an actor, writer and director and, and I guess I felt like I wanted to do more 
um, and it just took time to to do that. And I guess the great thing about um, regenerative farming or 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 eating regeneratively, whether you're a vegetarian or a vegan or a, or meat eater, is that you you are actually participating in the climate. You know, um, I don't need, what do you want to use the word crisis, but in you know doing something positive um, for the environment, you can actively make a choice with your dollars yeah. um, around your food choices. Um, so I think that's, you know, if, if there's anyone out there going like, oh, I am overwhelmed, I don't know how to, what to do or, um, you know, start looking, start looking up regenerative foods, start going to the farmer's market and talking to your, to the, to the storeholder and if they are the farmer, ask them about their farm, be interested, be curious, um, go to your butcher and ask them if they can source some regenerative meat. It's not easy and they probably are not going to do it. <laughs> But if you ask, and the more people who do, the more they will be inclined to because it's all about what the consumer wants. If the consumer starts asking, the shopkeepers and the supermarkets and the butchers will have to meet their demands mm. or else just start your own good farm shop <laughs> Yeah, <laughs> like we absolutely. did. <laughs> absolutely. I'm going to talk to you a little bit about <clears throat> fam- favourite Christmas recipes here in, in, in a moment <clears throat> as well. But it seems to be – there seems to be some recipes for participating and actually making – a difference. Mm. I mean, I'm hearing even just like sustainable comfort eating is mm. actually part of <laughs> the solution. I, I love the idea of comfort eating actually solving the climate crisis. So, oh yeah, yeah, nice. Um, I like it. Yeah. We had Sarah Wilson on this show a little while ago, and uh, and we talked to her about a, a new concept in in the world of psychology, which is that many kids now have PTSD, but not the old PTSD. Mm. They have pre-traumatic stress oh, disorder yeah. because they are reading the news about you know this yeah. looming climate crisis and as a result people now have pre-traumatic mm. uh, stress disorder and anxiety um, many women uh, particularly gen z and some some gen y are opting to remain childless because they don't want to bring a, a child into this world that mm. sort of has all the loom and doom over it mm. where you know and also then we hear about you know here's the carbon emissions you're responsible for if you put a child on this planet mm. you know like it's mm. there's so much sort of shame and anxiety about all of these but mm. you know the f- m- most fundamental sort of human need of actually sitting down and breaking bread and or comfort mm. eating mm. might be one of the solutions. I think that's, you know, super genius. Um, comfort eating, yeah. So I'm curious, um, what's on what's on the menu um, at Christmas um, in the Gooding and yeah. uh, and Brown family? And uh, and and my final little hack I'm going to ask for as well is if there's a way to do really good uh, glazing that doesn't involve too much sugar as well. So. Well, that's definitely one for Scott. But speaking oh, of carbon emissions, we're going to the UK. <laughs> no, we are going to the UK for Christmas with the family. Scott is from the UK and he hasn't been back in 12 years. So we're, wow. we're um, going to brave the, you know, 24 that's hours of odd. economy with the kids and wow. um, go over for three oh, weeks. Have I not told yeah. you? <laughs> <laughs> we've, we've cracked these jokes yeah. between us before. <laughs> Um, yeah, life, and so I think I don't know what is on the um, well, what will your mum cook or will you cook? Yeah, it's been um, <clears throat> close to twenty five years since I've probably had Christmas with my mum. Oh wow! Oh, at least yeah, at least seventeen. Uh, she always used to do because she, she she ran p- pubs. So by the time and so for and the so did month, your dad? Yeah. Should... So all of December there was Christmas turkey on the menu. There's a sort of um, ode to Christmas so by the time our Christmas dinner came and all the punters had left she was like I'm so over turkey so she used to do duck fast forward 17 years I don't I don't know what we'll be having I wouldn't <laughs> mind duck yeah um, but I think she, It'll her, be good. her um, love of cooking has somewhat diminished because she's that she did it for so she mm-hmm. did it for 40 years so I dare say I'd love to do something with her in the kitchen so I guess we'll we'll get there, unpack. We'll have that discussion about what everyone wants to have, and then we'll see what eventuates. Yeah. And I'm not the man to ask about glazing, <laughs> unless it's double. But um, tell you what, my mum does really good, and it's mm. not a glaze, but <clears throat> she does a chicken with grapes in it. 
So you put the chicken in or the turkey, you could do it with turkey, and you, you put grapes around. So you put it in for a bit, then you take it out, and about half an hour before it's ready, you put all the grapes around it, and then you put it back in, and the grapes, like, caramelise oh. and kind of um, get soft, and then the juice mixes in. It's just really good. Yeah. Genius. It's really good. You'd like never that. think it. Yeah. But that's absolute genius. I'm so gross. <laughs> Glazing. Uh, we're having glazing conversations in our in our family at the moment. Right. So, um, um, <clears throat> yeah. I wonder if there's any 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 recipes we should try out in the uh, from the sustainable diet, from the oh keto book, or anything else that you can recommend people to to check out, or anything off your website. Your ice cream's you pretty good. Your healthy ice cream. Yeah, there's a, there's there's a couple of ice creams. There's a a, a blueberry and chocolate ice cream. Um, that's always a winner. But there's a bunch of slow cooked dishes. Mm. You know, your your cheeks and your lamb shoulders and your ribs and all that yumminess. And I think people who may be unfamiliar with cooking and unfamiliar with those cuts might be somewhat surprised or impressed. Like you can really not bugger it up. Mm. As long as you've got, you know, a few herbs and you've seasoned it, and there's a bit of liquid in there, whatever that is, whether that's and, and play around with it. Like it could be white wine, could be rosé, could be red wine, it could be beer, it could be broth. Like there's no, you won't bugger it up. Mm. It'll taste amazing. But if you if, if they don't if it, have if the you book, do bugger it up, you can though. go to Scott's website. He has heaps of free recipes just on his site, which mm. is scottwoodingproject.com. Is that right? Yeah, there's loads on our website. Oh, too. and there's heaps yeah. on our website as well. Which is the good farm dot shop. Correct. Very correct. correct. Yeah. Farm dot shop. Yeah. All right. Mm -hmm. So go and check that out. There's some beautiful stuff to buy. I'm sure people can transact with, you know, dollars they, they, and, and Bitcoin. They can, and but if you're bringing else. this out before <laughs> Christmas, we we are uh, we literally do everything at our shop. I mean, it's just Scott and I. So there's yeah. no other people packing, picking, and packing while we're away. The shop is officially closed mm. oh, from like now until we get back on the ninth um well, you can still of course order. you can put orders in um you but get it. yeah it yeah. won't be fulfilled until we get back so have a yeah. beautiful christmas everyone yeah and i think a beautiful time to sort of slow down i mean it's always a reminder to kind of start taking it slow and the idea of slow cooking i find is actually you know, mm. very regenerative for, for mm. the soul as opposed to trying to do a mm. Oliver, Jamie mm. Oliver 20 minute meal and yeah. rush it out and yeah. just like let something, you know, simmer. stew yeah. away or simmer away yeah. through the whole day. I think there's maybe something therapeutic in that. Yeah. Yeah. Family agree. Yeah. Good. Thanks for coming on to the second Renaissance. I wish you all the best for, for Christmas and uh, yeah. no doubt we'll. Um, bump into each other in in the village which is of course avalon village as well yeah. um great to have you on the show and talk sustainability and, and sustainable comfort eating that's actually doing well and good for the planet thanks, good anyway. thanks for having us for more information about the second renaissance and our work on sustainable innovation please visit my website www.andersumanilson.com we would appreciate if you can take a moment to share the podcast with a friend or a colleague and help build the movement. We hope that what we learn together on the second renaissance can help us all build a sustainable future for ourselves and our children. See you in the near future.